I'm Guy Berryman, and this is Cars and Culture with Jason Stein. What an absolute pleasure to have you on the program. Guy, welcome into Cars and Culture. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, the, the, uh, it is absolutely wonderful to have you. And I want to start, um, I guess, probably with the obvious in that we haven't really seen you and your bandmates for a couple of years outside of some very unique video products that, that you've put out and obviously the uh, release of albums and videos that, that have been um, uh, released just even in the last month or so. It must feel good to have a tour that is up and coming, that's, that's in front of you. Um, yes, it really does. Um, our last tour ended in 2017. So, you know, it feels, it feels like a lifetime ago since we were playing in these kind of, you know, stadiums and, you know, with all these people in front of us. And, you know, li playing live is really kind of, you know, it's such an important part of being in a band because, you know, we kind of hide away in studios and make these albums and then they go onto this streaming platforms and people are in their houses listening to it. But, you know, really when you're playing live, that's when you have a chance to kind of be in the same space as the people that like your music. So um, it kind of, it, it's a, we need that reminder, you know, to, to know that there's people out there enjoying, you know, the creativity that we're um, focusing on and the music we're making in the studio. It's uh, an, an awesome undertaking to do what all of you do. And in fact, you're the, the stage setups are oftentimes elaborate. Uh, you've been filling stadiums around the world. How much rehearsal time is there to get ready for a tour like this, of this undertaking? Um, well, the rehearsal time is relatively uh, short. I think the preparation for the tour, the planning, um, organizing some of the more complex technical aspects of the tour. Um, it's something which happens several years before the tour starts. And uh, we're, we're actually, I'm actually in London at the moment, um, rehearsing with the guys and just, you know, from a musical point of view, figuring out how to play the new songs and remembering how to play the old songs. Um, and that's coming together quite well, but you know, the tricky thing about starting a tour like this with the ambition that we have for the show is with the best will in the world, you can, you can plan uh, in your mind um, how the show is going to be. But until you've actually done the first show, you don't really, you don't really fully understand how, how it's going to sit with you. And I think we always find that, you know, we need to get the first, you know, five or 10 shows underway for us to kind of really start digging in and, and modifying the set list and changing little bits of production to just refine it into the place where it usually settles and then, and then we carry on going. And uh, uh, we always get the show to a point where we feel very happy with it. And then that just kind of runs for the rest of the tour. So the first, the first few weeks are always about, you know, testing things and, and seeing how the set list flows from one song into another. And it's not until you've actually got a live audience in front of you that you can sometimes make these judgments. You spent four years uh, on the sidelines and two that, that were not uh, planned, obviously, uh, given the situation around COVID. How tough was that? I mean, you, you were so used to having a, um, a schedule and, and an exhaustive uh, tour schedule. I know you got into all kinds of other things, which we're going to talk about here today, but how difficult was it to, to not be a part of that? Um, some may have said the hamster wheel of the past. And, yeah. and maybe do you look back on it as, as it not being as much of a grind as it, as it was when you were living it? I, I mean, honestly, I don't think we would have been touring any earlier than we are now. Um, so I don't feel we've lost any time and, you know, with respect to when this tour is starting, um, of course, you know, COVID has been, you know, an unbelievable, you know, tragedy across the world in, in, in many ways. Um, and the first lockdown was, it, it took some getting used to, 
it, it was it was unlike anything any of us had ever um, experienced before. And I think for somebody in my position who's traveling constantly for with the band, and I travel constantly for other projects that I'm involved in, um, to have this kind of enforced um, situation where you're just in your home for such a long period of time without thinking about packing a suitcase or jumping on a flight to you know x y z uh, destination it, it took a little little bit of getting used to but quite honestly once i settled into the rhythm of that it felt like quite an interesting place to be and of course you just modify we all had to kind of adjust the way that we communicate with people um the way that we work I think creatively, it was very interesting for me to, to just have ideas and to develop ideas in, in, in the, you know, in the space of my own, you know, home and studio that I have at home. Um, so I really settled into it and just tried to turn it into a positive thing um, as much as one could in such a negative uh, scenario. Um, so it was a pretty, it was a pretty um I kind of enjoyed it in the end, mm. you know, I really got into the rhythm of it. And of course we found as a band, we found ways of communicating with each other. We, we were still able to work on our album um, by sending files over to each other. And of course, you know, you can make, you can make hit records on a laptop now, <laughs> you know, exactly. you don't need big fancy studios. And so we just figured out a way of working and to kind of keep things moving forwards creatively as a band and you know i have a fashion label as well and uh we launched the label actually in the midst of the pandemic uh which was interesting because it's a relatively expensive brand and of course everybody was really concerned about you know their livelihoods and their incomes and so it was a strange time to to attempt to la launch a, a kind of a, a fairly luxury uh line um but we did it. Uh, and of course, the ongoing development processes that, that we had for creating new garments, uh, we, we had to figure out how to, my design studio for the labels based in Amsterdam. So we had to figure out a way of designing garments um, over Zoom, essentially. I mean, we were sending prototypes back backwards and forwards to each other. But, you know, like everyone, I think we all adjusted pretty well and pretty quickly to just keep the wheels moving swapping of audio files, swapping of drawings. Uh, you, you just reinvented how creativity could be shared among people, didn't you? But you, you just didn't well, have to be in the same place. Absolutely. And I think we all realized that a lot of the traveling that we were doing prior to the pandemic was probably unnecessary. And I think that, that's one good thing that's come out, out of it is the culture of um, communication and Zoom. And I, I, I just think all of those behaviors that we adopted during COVID and uh, in order to move forwards, we're, we're still, we're, we're kind of maintaining those habits going forward as we kind of come out of the situation. And in fact, you were already working with sustainability consultants to prepare to go on the road in a more um, eco-friendly uh, uh, method and, you know, process and things like electric vehicles um, from, a, from a sustainability point of view, um, aviation, fuel, battery technology. If anything, this could have just jump-started many of those efforts, I'm guessing. It did. It did. Uh, we had a lot of interest from companies who were willing to offer their services and their products and their technologies to, to help us with our tour. Um, and we are you know, we've, we've built in a lot of those ideas into the, in, into the tour, which starts in a few weeks time in, uh, in uh, Costa Rica. Yeah. It, it'll be, it'll be amazing to see uh, how all of that uh, comes together. I want to talk about something that some people might not know. There's a, a real good chance that if a, a decision or two had gone one way or the other, that you would be a mechanical engineer that. Sure. It, <laughs> and you, you, your father worked on the, channel tunnel the channel yes, yes yes the channel tunnel yes which is the which there's the big tunnel which joins england to france 
But you were you were an engineer at heart, you and as as was your father. You uh, are yes, I, I think uh, th that's certainly um, the way my brain is wired is very much um, as an engineer. Um, I, I think as a small child, I was always quite advanced with. Uh, I mean, the, I always get told the story when I was about two years old. I discovered how to use a screwdriver, and uh, I used to go around the house with my screwdriver, um, taking off all the electrical sockets uh, from the wall, <laughs> which which sounds pretty terrifying. But it does sound terrifying. I've always, actually, I, I've always had a very um, analytical brain um a, a very kind of creative side to me and um i was studying engineering at, at college when when we formed the band uh architecture also was a great is, is a great passion of mine so what do you think you would have ended up doing had you not met the three i think guys? um i you know i think it would have been definitely some kind of product design whether it would have been uh, in automotive or architecture or, or industrial design i think that's you know, I think that's what I, I think that's the path I was clearly, clearly going down. Um, but I always had a huge passion for music since I was a teenager, uh, 12 or 13 years old, when I decided I wanted to um, become a bass player. Um, and of course, you go to an opportunity, you know, we formed the band and we had the opportunity to turn, you know, turn it into a career. Uh, with a record deal uh, from EMI, uh, and you know when you're 19 years old, you don't you don't say no, <laughs> you don't say no to that kind of opportunity. You spent a lot of time um, interested in your father's triumph. Uh, your well, yes, that was the that was the that was my passion. That, that's where my passion for cars came from. When I was living in Scotland, my father, when my father was in the navy. Uh, as a younger man, I think he was in his mid twenties. He bought a Triumph TR3A, um, and I've seen pictures of him standing next to it. You know when he bought it, uh, which are brilliant. But when I was, by the time I was born, um, the, the car was mothballed and it was up on bricks in the garage. Um, boxes had been piled on top of it and just it was just covered in junk and it had come off the road many years before I was born and he always planned to restore it um, but never got around to doing it and I used to always go into the garage and just kind of lift up you know one corner of the cover that was over the car and just see this kind of incredible curvaceous fender and it was just the most exotic car thing i'd ever seen it's got a very it's got a very nice body shape the triumph tr3a and it always really bugged me that throughout my childhood it, it just sat there and uh and he never got around to to fixing it up so actually by the time i'd made a few albums and done a few tours and earned some money i said to him dad look let's just find let's find the best triumph restorer that we can find and I'm going to pay for it. I just want this car restored because it was always, he always made a point of telling me when, when I was growing up that when he goes, I'm getting that car. So <laughs> I kind of wanted, <laughs> I kind of wanted to see it finished. And I also wanted to see him use it. Um, so we, so we had that car restored by a guy in England. And um, I, I mean, I'm pretty sure this is the most expensive Triumph TR3A in the world. <laughs> Um, <laughs> it's, uh, they're not wildly valuable cars, but of course, restoration costs are what they are, you know, whether you're restoring a Ferrari or a Triumph, you know, you still, you still pay a lot of money. Um, so yeah, that was the, that, that was the, that, that was where the birth of my passion for cars came from my father and his, and his Triumph. And you've always, you've always had that. And, and when you got to a point, as you say, when you, a, a few albums were complete, you had the opportunity to then start a collection and start adding things into the collection uh, beyond the triumph. Yeah, uh, I, I did. Um, I mean, prior to that, when I was still at school uh, as a teenager, I was helping. My dad had MGs as well. He had an MG BGT and an MG Midget. 
and Loyal uh, I used British to, brands. <laughs> yeah, well, he's very, you know, he, he was a Navy, Royal Navy guy and it was all British sports cars. And that was the, you know, this Italian Exotico was not on their radar. Um, but I used to, uh, at weekends, you know, pull those cars apart and, you know, um, so I kind of really cut my teeth on, on, on how cars go together when I was a teenager. And then of course, yeah, I started collecting cars when I was probably, um, probably in my, uh, mid to late twenties. That's when, that's when my collection started. What was the first one that you added to the collection beyond the triumph? Uh, it was an E-type okay. and the story was, um, um, I, I wanted to do something in engineering and something in restoration. Um, so I ended up buying an E-type to restore, but there was quite a long journey to get to the E-type because what I actually attempted to do was to buy, what I really wanted to do was to buy a Supermarine Spitfire, you know, the, 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 the airplane, World War II uh, yeah. British yeah. fighter plane. Um, and a friend of mine, uh, who's now my kind of workshop manager, um, a guy called Glenn, um, he had a passion for Spitfires as well. So I was like, okay, well, let's find one. Let's find a Spitfire to restore and we'll just figure it out and we'll start doing flying lessons and we'll fly this thing. Um, turned out that was a bit too ambitious because you don't just find unrestored Spitfires sitting in barns. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and even if you, even if you did, you have to have extremely specialized knowledge and uh, engineering skills and certifications to be able to get one of these things airworthy at a huge expense. Um, and then if you want to fly them, find a knee type. <laughs> well, exactly. If you want, and then if you want to fly one of these planes, which are extraordinarily dangerous airplanes to fly, especially if you've just passed your flying test. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway the whole thing didn't stack up and i thought okay well let's just kind of lower our um ideas a little bit and and i ended up purchasing a uh a, a jaguar type in need of restoration and 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 we were off with the whole journey never thought of the spitfire again or are you still thinking well that? actually i mean if if i really want to bore you with the story before we got to the e-type i actually did buy a tiger moth oh um and uh and try to restore that but again realized that i didn't have the uh, the you know certain qualifications required to to get a, an air a, an old airplane airworthy so i actually did send that plane to someone else to restore uh, and they restored it and it's flying and uh, you know i sold it and it's flying uh, and it does kind of you know you can go and uh take a ride in a tiger moth and uh, <laughs> my tiger moth which i had restored Amazing. Your interest in cars really fundamentally lies in the, in, in the engineering back to that again, and the concepts behind them and all you, you have said that all of the cars that are in your collection have something significant beneath the surface. You love form following function. We're going to talk about Porsches in a minute, but form following function and how that industrial design and, and by the way, whether it's clothing or cars, is uh is a mantra that you really follow at all times is that fair i think that's fair what's special about car i think why i'm particularly drawn to cars and particularly classic cars is they encapsulate so so many disciplines that i'm interested in so i love engineering so i'm interested in in you know i love engines and gearboxes um uh, I love the story and the development of engines and, and, and just the whole powertrain of a car. Um, I, I also feel, especially with the cars that I like, which are predominantly uh, European sports cars from the 1960s, I think broadly that describes what I like. Um, they're like sculptures, you know, so I can appreciate the, 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 the form of the cars. Um, you know, on a, on a sculptural level, but then, you know, really when you're looking at those era, era of cars, the interiors, the leather work, the stitching, I mean, there's all these disciplines rolled into one object and I'm fascinated by all of those different disciplines that have been uh, put into this kind of singular, beautiful object. And what is it about that era that draws you in? Uh, I think, uh, I, I really believe 
cars back then have a certain shape, a certain fluidity, which can only come when you're drawing by hand. Mm. So modern, modern day automotive design uh, leaves me a little bit cold. Um, and, and I fundamentally feel that it's, it's due to the, the tools which designers use to create shapes and to create form. Um, I think automotive, if you think about those CAD programs, you know, you can make very complex things very quickly when you're running a CAD program, which you can't do when you're drawing something by hand. You know, a, two, a Ferrari 275 GTB could only have ever been drawn by a hand and a pencil. And so I think that's, it, it was the limitations that designers had in the 50s and 60s, um, combined with, you know, the huge cultural freedom um, and just sense of hope that um, swept across the world, you know, post-World War II, which allowed people to explore all of these wild ideas. Um, so for me, there was just a kind of, a, it, was a, it was lots of things coming together in that era at the same time, which created something greater than the sum of its parts. I mean, I, I find mid-century design, whether it be cars or uh, architecture or furniture is just something that I don't have to think about. I just see it and I like it. Mm. Yeah. Cars by their very nature and the design of cars are, are emblematic of the generation at that time, aren't they? And, and maybe it says something about where we are currently in the design of what we're seeing on the roads today. It, it, it's a spirit that you just described. There was a spirit of the sixties. There was a spirit of the, of the products developed in the sixties. And now you see a return to that minimalist and form and function now. Right. I think so. I think we're seeing, uh, I, I think we've got to a point where these, uh, if we're talking about sports cars and these uh, supercars and hypercars. They became something where so many fins were, uh, and wings and bits of carbon fiber were added just for the sake of stylization. You know, they, they don't necessarily have um, a function, but it's just to do something which looks good on a website or looks good on Instagram. Um, and I think it's particularly interesting. We've got to a point now where I think people are starting to see through that and, um, I had an interesting conversation with Gordon Murray, who's um, mm -hmm. cr creating some very interesting cars at the moment. And his whole mantra is, a, is about a return to beauty, to simplicity and, and, and to a fluidity and a simplicity of shape um, that's going into the cars and just removing anything which is just not needed. And that, that, that's something which I'd like to see happen more and more in automotive design. You have such an interesting collection. I, I want to focus on just, just a few of them. Your Bugatti Veyron. It's, it's um, certainly not a 1960s model. <laughs> and, nope. and, it, and it has one mode, which is fast. But you, you love the, the, the spirit of it, the design of it again, right? Is that what well, draws I, you? I, that's an interesting one. Um, it's certainly because, rare. Uh, what do I want to say about the Veyron? I think it's quite a pretty car. You know, I think, I think there is a simplicity to that car. And what I was really drawn to was it, just the scale of the brief uh, th that was given to that car um, by Ferdinand Pieck. Uh, and the fact that they delivered on it, um, I thought was a milestone in, in engineering. Um, Honestly, I've sold the car um, because I didn't like driving it that much, <laughs> actually. Um, and what, what was it, it you it, didn't it, like about it? It was it was wildly powerful. Um, the road noise was quite immense in the cabin because the tires were so wide. Uh, it was it was very difficult to maneuver. Uh, I live in the countryside and the lanes are quite narrow and it's really, uh, it's, it's a very big wide car. Um, 
but you know beyond the kind of engineering prowess which went into that car and you know the engine's phenomenal and the, uh, and the brief was phenomenal and, and they delivered upon it and it was a real game changer in terms of what people were doing with sports cars i felt i was quite uncomfortable i was always quite uncomfortable about heavy the car about how heavy the car was um i i do believe that cars are still too heavy sports cars are still still too heavy um but honestly the the, the killer for me was uh the cost of ownership of that car um the, the servicing costs average cost oil tires um i feel you know i i don't know the exact numbers but i think the the the, the project costs for um for the veyron it ended up costing the company something like 5 million euros each to produce the car. Um, and I think, the, I think the sale price at the time was, you know, like a million euros when they were new. So they were, so they lost so much money on that project. Yeah. Yeah. It was ambitious. And I just, I just don't understand how on an annual basis, you know, you have to pay so much money to keep the car on the road. Um, and I have a sneaking suspicion it's some kind of <laughs> uh, it's some kind of scheme to, uh, for them to try and get back some of the money they lost on the you know on, on the project. And and honestly, I just feel like I I don't, I don't want to I I didn't drive the car that much. Uh, it doesn't have a great use case, certainly for me. Um, and I, I just I didn't enjoy how much money I was burning through just owning the car. We interviewed Rob Dickinson on this show. I'm, I know you probably know him from Catherine Wheel. Uh, he is the well. Uh, I know him from from Singer more than <laughs> exactly from Singer Vehicle Design, yeah. right? We interviewed him, and we and I asked him, of course, what what Singer does with Porsches, and he said Porsche is the perfect vehicle to own from his perspective because you can absolutely beat the hell out of it on the track. And it'll come back for more, or you can take it touring through the English countryside, and it's a great daily driver. You have five classic Porsches, I think, if not more. And y your your view on on that brand? I tend to agree. I tend to agree. Um, if you were to have one car, one classic car. Uh, it would be a sensible choice because for, for all those reasons, you can you can put it on a racetrack, you can drive it down a gravel uh, rally track. Um, they're they're pretty comfortable. You can get you can get four people in them. They've got pretty good luggage space. Um, they're quite reliable if you set them up properly. They look good. Uh, we're talking about the nine eleven here, I guess. Yeah, the nine eleven. Yes, yes, yeah. of course. Yeah. Um, and. Yeah, I, I would say if you had to have one car and you, if you were saying, okay, I'm, I'm interested in buying a classic car, but I only ever want to have one and I want to keep it forever and I want to do this, 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 and this, then you would have to steer somebody to the 911. It would be a hard, it would be a hard car to beat. Um, I, I'd say it would be closely followed for me by the E-Type, mm. which, is, which is also a very usable classic car and this is my whole thing you know I, I, I my collection at some point was i think over 30 cars and now it's down to probably half of that and it might even get smaller because i've got to the point where i don't just want to have these cars sitting in my garage taking up space and not being used so if there's anything if the if there's anything in there now which isn't really getting used because I don't enjoy driving it or it doesn't have a use case, then I'm probably thinking about moving it on because I, I, I really do believe that we have to use these cars. Yeah, you've, you've said, I don't think people drive their cars enough in the classic space, which is a shame uh, from a personal standpoint and a cultural point of view. I mean, these are, these are vehicles that need to be for the, uh, used for their intended purpose. It's not just show cars. I know. I know is your belief. Absolutely, it's true, and it, and it's good for them to be used. You know, it keeps them it keeps them working well. You know, a car that's been sitting around, not being used for a year or so, it, and you try and take it out for a drive, you're you're not going to get far. Um, 
I think the trouble is now in this day and age, modern cars have become so good, so comfortable. They're like mobile offices. Mm. You know, they're quiet. The air conditioning is great. Washy. They don't, they right. don't break down. They're comfortable. Uh, and the better modern cars get, the harder it becomes to jump in a classic car because you're just, it's like it, they smack you in the face with how unrefined they are, how noisy they are. Um, you, you can't make a phone call in a classic car because the engine noise is, is too much. Um, you know, you, you get your destination and you step out of the car and you smell your clothes and you can smell the fuel. Um, if you've ever done a, a, a long European road trip and you've got a, you know, you've got your soft bag in the, you know, in the trunk and you go into your hotel and you, and you unpack your clothes, all your clothes smell like fumes. <laughs> <laughs> so it becomes wow. it becomes more and more of a a challenge to um to enjoy driving the old cars i feel and, and, well, you, uh, and also and you have to also remember that if you're trying to get someplace in an old car you might not actually get there it's true enough well, and in fact you've been in the millimilia the famous race i've done the millimilia yeah i've done i've done many um european i i, I i've taken part in uh uh, the modern Accento Ora, which is a great rally. The uh, the Coupe des Alpes, the Mille Miglia. I've done the, the Tour of Tour Auto several times, which is a, a very challenging uh, rally. Um, and I love to drive uh, up in Scotland. The north of Scotland is fantastic for driving uh, mm. old cars in. Um, and that's something that I've really missed over the last couple of years is actually feeling that freedom of movement in in an old car stopping off at a restaurant meeting friends in in europe um and and just being part of the, the the wider culture which surrounds classic car ownership you've been to grand prix races um is there an automotive event that you cannot stay away from is there a must attend uh, event for you let me think about that i think one that i always gravitate to is the le mans classic which mm. happens once every two years um that's an exceptional event um if for nothing else just to hear the gt40s roar out of the pit lane um goodwood is you know the goodwood hosts a lot of fantastic events as well um and there's some you know some of the concourse events i really enjoy um beach um uh, uh, Villa d'Este and there's a fantastic one at Chanty uh, which is part of the Peter Auto group as well as Le Mans Classic um, and I've judged at many of these events and enjoy judging um, because it's so so it's such a sociable it's it's kind of a small tight-knit community and you end up going in and taking part in, in, in these uh, these juries and uh, everybody knows everyone else so it's always nice to turn up there and just catch up with old friends we saw that Michael Schumacher would in the off season come to the United States and ride motorcycles because he could go around the U S unnoticed. The same is true for Lewis Hamilton in some circles. Is that something that you covet? Um, I don't ever really get noticed. And that's the, that's kind of the, I'm in a famous band, but I'm not, you know, I, I'm not a famous uh, or particularly recognizable person. And, and, and that suits me fine because I'm quite private by nature. Um, Chris is very recognizable, of course, and he has a very different situation when he goes out and about. But um, but for me, it's never it's never an issue. Hmm. You you are a, an enormous fan of uh, collecting film in the, while in the United States, right? That's <laughs> your film. Um, um uh photos photos that oh, are photos oh well look i'm a collector i i, I mean i i got the disease very very <laughs> badly and i call you know i collect uh uh all manner of things that people would find very uninteresting i do collect old photographs color film um, slides is i guess what i was intending oh i get. collect i collect old film slides um i collect um primarily oh, of cars I, too right well, I do. Well, I, yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting because I have a very large uh, archive of um, period um, magazines from from the 1940s 
through to the 1970s for you know American titles, British titles, European titles, um, which is something. Again, I was I just became obsessed with you know I I have every single um, issue of uh, Hot Rod magazine from you know from when it started to I think 1979, and they're all meticulously filed in order. Wow. Um, I have all of road and track and I have German titles. So it's a huge library. I mean, I really, um, you know, when I bite down on something, I, I don't really kind of let go until I've, you know, I'm a completist when it comes to collecting and, um, and the archive has actually proven to be over the years, very, uh, very helpful in restoration of some of the cars that I've found as projects and, uh, and projects that I've been managing some rare cars and some racing cars and a lot of my archive has actually thrown out a lot of the history of cars that I uh, that, that I bought knowing that there was something special about them but didn't have the complete picture um so yeah you know cars vinyls cameras watches uh lamps I'm just kind of travel the world and go to junk shops and buy it all up <laughs> well and you can and you can add to your own magazine archive now with your role at the road rat uh mm. your friendship with mikey harvey former editor of car magazine brought you to the genesis of the road rat can you explain right. how that came to be uh well mikey and i became friends um through the other road rat founder a guy called john clayden um and we would hang out and we would go driving cars. And um, one of the things that, that really struck us was I consume quite a lot of magazines, you know, these kind of coffee table independently published, you know, beautiful magazines on specialist subjects. So if you're into design, you can buy, there's amazing titles in design or uh, if you, you know, if you, even if you're into wine, there's, there's incredible wine publications, which are beautiful, independently published magazines and I think for us it was strange we were buying all these mag car magazines from newsstand um, and it suddenly struck us why why is there no kind of beautifully produced uh, kind of coffee table magazine for for cars and we we kind of said well surely there must be we just haven't found it let's look around and we were looking around and we couldn't really find anything that, that was kind of done to a certain uh, production level and we thought well this is this is surely this is an open goal you know we, we we've got to make this and with you know with my archive and my passion for cars and John Clayton he's a car collector as well and Mikey's experience in editing Top Gear magazine as well as many other uh, automotive titles um, we pulled together a very small skeleton team uh, and and several years ago we, we we launched the first edition of the road rat um, and we're now currently um, on issue 10. It's a quarterly magazine. Uh, it's a big magazine. Yeah, it's thick um, and glossy. Uh, and yeah, it's all those things you described. It's, it's a coffee table magazine. It's a coffee table magazine. I think that's the best way of describing it. Um, it's a difficult thing to describe because it isn't like any other magazine I, I believe out there. Um, and what was important to us to do was to create something where we weren't follow, following the automotive calendar. So the stories which appear in the road rat um, don't become old um, after a couple of months. We, we, we tried to tell stories about cars, the origin of cars, the human story behind the cars, the designers of these cars or the racers of these cars. We do, do cover new cars as well, but we try to do it in a slightly different way from, from everyone else. Um, so if, for instance, if you're new to discovering the road rat and, and you, uh, and are, you're jumping in when we're on, uh, issue 10, you could still go back to issue one and read it in the same way as everyone else read it when it first came out, because it's kind of timeless, timeless stories. So many people, uh, over the last number of years have pronounced the death of the print product, but I think I'm with you. If you have a specialty niche that is evergreen, as they say, stories that are timeless in a well-documented format, doesn't that print product provide the antithesis or even the remedy to the day after day, email after email 
app after app slog that we all go through? Isn't it a relief? Yes, I think it, it, we sort of see the road rat as a, as a quiet place where you would sit down, uh, you would you would make a cup of coffee, you would find a quiet place in your house, and you would sit down for you know a couple of hours at a time and um, and just kind of sink into it. You know, it's not kind of scrolling through things on Instagram or social media or or, or digital. Um, I, I would say that one of the biggest challenges facing print media is the newsstand model which we don't which we're not a part of you can only you can only buy our magazine through our website and i think the issue is when you're playing into a newsstand model of course the newsstand take you know a large percentage of your cover price um and so it's just a race to bring costs down as much as you can in terms of the production of the magazine and I don't know if you've noticed, but magazines have gotten thinner and thinner and thinner mm -hmm. um, over the last few years. And they've got more and more ads and less and less content um, simply because they're hamstrung by the newsstand model. You know, so from the outset, we decided, OK, well, we can't play into that game. Uh, we have to we have to build slowly. Uh, we have to sell direct to consumer. Um, and you know and thankfully it's paying off you know we have a big subscriber base now um that's not to say that um i uh, you know i do feel that there's a lot of people uh, who are into cars um across europe across america across japan that are, are still yet to discover the road rat um but it's growing all the time and i'm just so happy with with the fact when people discover it they 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 tend to send us extremely positive uh, remarks about you know how happy they are to have um, become a subscriber and how happy they are with the, the quality of the magazine. The Road Rat website again is the place where you'll find the opportunity to purchase the quarterly issue. So a little a little plug for you there. The automobile is one of the most important inventions that revolutionized the modern world in America. The rich history of car culture runs deep as technology continues to shape the future of the industry. Jason Stein, former publisher of Automotive News, is here to share the stories of people passionate about cars, from industry leaders and innovators to car-obsessed celebrities. Buckle up as Jason takes you inside the boardroom, onto the track, and around the bend on Cars and Culture on Sirius XM Business Radio.